After Law. You can get more details and catch prior episodes at www.shefterlaw.com. The Stress-Free IEP Video Podcast is also posted on YouTube and LinkedIn, and you can listen to episodes through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Now, here's the host of Stress-Free IEP, Francis Schefter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Today's guest, I'm really excited because Jennifer Strong is a school neuropsychologist. And if you've been watching the show for a while, my absolute first guest back in February of 2022 was also a school neuropsychologist. And it's not very often that there are school-based neuropsychologists from my understanding. Um, so, but Jennifer is out in Newport, California, Newport Beach, California, and works uh, or owns Cognitive Diagnostic Associates. So Jennifer, I'm so excited because we get to like talk yeah. a little bit because our first guest was New York, the first one. So now we can like kind of talk about how it's a little bit different in different states. So tell us a little about yourself. Like how did you get into this field and what's your background? Yeah, we can go coast to coast, which is really nice. First, you know, thanks for having me on. This is wonderful. Um, so a little bit about me, my background, I actually am Alaska grown. I grew up in Alaska. My parents are from California and my father was the only physician in a small fishing village in Seldovia, Alaska. So wow. I got to see firsthand the care and the, the amount of time and the, you know, the empathy and everything that went involved in medicine, um, from that type of lens. Uh, so I then went to do an undergraduate degree at University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, because I knew I wanted to be in sunny Southern California. And, and Very North. different. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so then I did a sports um, sports management degree and a psychology bachelor's uh, double major. And then I wow. fell in love with special ed somehow. I, I, I looked back at my small town and saw all the need that was there. Um, and then just slowly started to get into to school psychology. Yeah. Very right, cool. Yeah, that's, it's interesting, like how, I mean, cause I wouldn't think sports medicine and special education, you know, kind of like okay. a little bit different there. But surprisingly they do because, you know, we work with adaptive physical education specialists, o OTs, PTs. And now that I know about gait, human movement, um, you know, adduction, abduction, all of that, it's actually been a blessing in disguise because I can really have those communications with my adaptive physical education specialist, with my OT. So it's that actually- makes been, sense. Yeah, very, very beneficial. Because that's one of the things, like part of the reason for this show is that, you know, each of our extra, dis, you know, our areas, disciplines, even though we're all working with the disability community, there's different language and different knowledge base and stuff. And so part of the reason for the show is to explain to parents like, hey, look, you can understand it. Here's how we can help you. Um, but that's, I love that, that, that it makes sense that knowing that part, I would say would make your assessments more robust, like your reports, because you know, like, the full, like how to make the mental and the physical, right? Right. Yeah. And I didn't really realize it till later on in my career when it kind of clicked. And I was like, hold on, like I did something really, really amazing by getting these two degrees together. Uh, I didn't know it in the past, but now looking at now when I can look at an APE report or a PT or, or occupational therapy report, I can really understand it better from that lens. Yeah, that's so cool. It's because yeah. it's so important. Um, understanding all, and I love that you say. I went. To, I actually took the family to Alaska this summer. So, uh, oh, nice! What city? Beautiful. Um, we did a cruise. We were in Juneau, um, Ketchikan, and I can't think of the third one. I can't think of the third one. We were in and out of Cal uh, um, Canada, though, out of Vancouver. Yeah, yeah it's so, beautiful yeah, it was, that area. It, it was very beautiful. Was yeah, go beautiful. back in the summer. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. We were. We were there in August. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, like until you have actually seen the glaciers, you know, you can't describe them, right? And yeah. So um, that's what I was saying. Very different than uh, California. Um, so you're in California. So I know you said you grew up in Alaska. Like, how, did you work in other states also? Yeah. So I, I did all my schooling here in California, um, and. I actually have done a little bit of time being what uh, a school psychologist in Texas. 
um, we did move our family there for a little bit uh, and we lived in Austin, Texas. So I did, I am licensed there. I don't know if it's current. I should probably check into that, but I, you know, I did take the test. I studied for it. Texas ed code is completely different than California ed code. Um, so they call them LSSPs. Uh, and now they actually are now called school psychologists. So there's kind of a big victory, but they used to in the past be called licensed specialist of school psychology. Uh, okay. So yeah, so now um, I do kind of understand Texas Ed Code slightly, but I definitely understand California Ed Code a lot more. Got it. Which is so, you know, it's so different because I say often, you know, I practice internationally, as I've said, um, and it's federal law. And so all states and American schools in international countries have to follow the federal law, but each state interprets it slightly different or tweaks it a little bit. Yes. Right. Uh, and it's very interesting to follow. Right. It's very interesting to see how I, I feel like we're doing a decent job following federal law for the most part. But yeah, when it gets down to the state, it's it's very different. Like California uh, in the past, you couldn't give an IQ test to an African-American student. And our board, wow. uh, we just voted on that to kind of have a memorandum to go to the California Department of Ed. Um, and now that's changed. Right. So yeah, it's like right. different things in, in state uh, law that changed based on case law. Yeah. No, it was interesting. Like, one of the things that I remember um, looking into, because I did have a client in California and that in California, summer vacations, I think it's any vacations over five days, like tolls the special education timelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's yeah. not the same in Maryland. Maryland, it does not at Ooh. all. What 90 is 90 days is 90 days, period. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If it, you know, like you can ask July one and that starts your, your clock. Uh -huh. um, it doesn't matter that we're not in session at all. Um, you know, if you have a meeting in, you know, June 1st and you say, you know, they agree to assess and it's an initial assessment. They have 60 days from day of consent wow. to come to the table, period. Um, yeah. So no break over holidays. Like, nope. yeah. No, nope. which makes sense because like, if not, you know, like, okay, so let's wait two and a half months because we have summer vacation, you know, and you're just, who's suffering? The child. Right. Um, so it's, yeah. I always find it interesting that California, I don't want to say gets away with it, but interprets it mm -hmm. that way that it does. Because I guess, you know, federal law is is kind of silent on it. So yeah. it's how does, how does the state interpret that and apply yeah. it? Yeah, that would make sense. And I know for at least us, our spring breaks are typically Monday through Friday, five days. So for spring break, the timeline doesn't stop or anything, but it has to be over five days. So if it's six days or longer, then it, right. then it stops. Yeah. Which I guess, I mean, it, in some ways I could see that totally making sense. Cause I know for me, like over the summer, it's not the same team. Your teachers aren't there. And so you're going to have a summer team doing the assessment that doesn't necessarily know the child. Mm -hmm. um, and not, I mean, the summer team is just as you know qualified as everybody else, but it's just different. Um, mm -hmm. so you can see why it kind of makes sense. And there has been times that I've like delayed requesting the meeting because we wanted to make sure that it was the school team doing it, um, type situation. But then there's okay. other times that we're like, you know what, the school's been delaying it long enough. Like, no, y'all need to get it done period. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you guys are similar, but we have some verbiage called without undue delay yeah. or without, okay. Similar stuff. And I don't know if that was a state or a federal law, but it seems like yes. there's a fair amount of undue delay happening. Uh, yeah. whatever that undue word means. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's, it's typical laws, right? It's, it's vague. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Left up to interpretation. Um, so, so what, like, so you're a school of neuropsychologist, you work based out of a school or are you private Howard? Like, how does that work? Yeah. So I was in the school districts for many, many years. And this was also a blessing in disguise because I got to see four different districts in Southern California. Um, and so I got to make relationships and meet the, um, the special ed department and meet the school district and see how they operate. And they operate all slightly differently. Right. But, but okay. similar, but different. Um, and so after that experience, uh, I decided to branch out and do private practice. So in California, uh, and I think there's one other state, you can be a licensed educational psychologist. So you sit for your state board and our, ours is the Board of Behavioral Sciences in California. Um, and then you take a test and you pass it. 
I went further and I actually did Dan Miller's program, uh, Kids Inc., to do the extra credential uh, for the school neuropsychologist program. So it's called an ABSMP. Um, and so that's what I have with that program um, on top of the LEP. So it's just a additional lens on looking at different types of memory and learning and attention and all of that. Yeah. So, they, so your private practice, you don't work with the schools anymore? Yeah, to answer your question. So, yeah. so <laughs> private practice. <laughs> uh, so after the schools, um, yeah. So went into private practice and decided to open my own business. So that's how Cognitive Diagnostic was Diagnostic Associates was opened. Um, we've been open for about a year now, um, and we operate in Orange County, California, Los Angeles, and San Diego, and then we're going to open San Francisco soon, um, and then hopefully go into other states, right? Um, so I really saw a need after working in the schools that long that, hey, we don't have everybody under one roof. We have, if you need an outside evaluation and the parents don't agree with the report from the district, um, you have to piecemeal it together. You have to, okay, you have to go to this psychologist. You have to go to this occupational therapist and they're not the same practice. They don't necessarily communicate with each other the best as it could be under one house and one roof. So we have 40 employees right now and growing. Wow. Uh-huh. And so we've done a wonderful job. We just hired on a new physical therapist. We hired on a new registered nurse. Um, we have a lot of uh, practitioners that can fill all those needs for especially our kiddos that have more uh, impact, more needs to be assessed. So that's kind of how so I came into That's awesome. So you do, so then the company does private assessments. Do you do like independent educational evaluations at um, public expense? Or do you just yeah. do private? So we do a public expense. And so that's part of the, the laws that parents are uh, kind of unaware of, uh, is that they are entitled to that outside evaluation at public expense. Uh, and so advocating for that to let them know they have that option. Um, we, we have a few avenues. So one, we do take insurance. So we do, if it's a medical model evaluation that needs to be done through that channel, we can do that. Two, we take, you know, uh, the, the district will fund it. Uh, and three, sometimes if there's severe enough or there's a, a need, parents will pay privately out of pocket. It, and it just depends on each case by case situation. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it's interesting with the IEs. Um, it, it's, I've done a lot of talking about it and stuff and what people mm -hmm. don't realize. I've had clients come and like, well, I asked them to do an evaluation and independent and they just said no. I'm like, well, they're not allowed to just say no, yeah. you know, like federal law, they have two options. Like one, they authorize it or two, they file due process against you to stand behind and say that their evaluations are, um, are proper. Right. So, and that's like, that's it. Um, interestingly, it had had been my experience that I had pretty much always, the school is just offered a pay because it's just it's easier um, mm -hmm. than not. But uh, more recently, I've actually had school districts file against my clients. Oh, uh, interesting. To say, yeah, to say that theirs, theirs was a valid. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the cost of litigation, usually my parents just drop the request because it's cheaper for them to go pay for it themselves than to pay me to defend it and potentially not win, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's so. the cost analysis. Uh, yeah. Majority of the time that from my experience, uh, and again, we've only been open a year, but within this year, most districts have approved uh, the IEE. There are a handful of them that have said, hey, we're going to file to defend. Um, but, you know, it, it it just depends on if it's legally defensible, right? And so right. We, we really try to educate our parents to say, this is kind of what's going to happen. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for them to respond and we tell them about the terms, you know, without undue delay um, and then their options just so they know. So they're informed on what, what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, ha I have this show and then I have my YouTube channel has over a hundred videos and yeah. that's the whole thing to inform parents like, Hey, you don't mm -hmm. have to take this, you know, like mm -hmm. here's your remedy. And I always say like, it's, I don't think the schools aren't doing it, you know, um, in a mean way or maliciously or you know anything it's just sometimes the schools don't even know 
Mm -hmm. um, I look back to when I was a teacher um, and a special ed coordinator. And I remember when I was going to law school and a lot of my friends in the um, school system were like, don't forget your signature is right next to our signature. <laughs> like, uh -huh. What's that supposed to mean? And then once I got into law school looking at it, I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. So what we thought, because that's what we were always taught and what the school system said to do, wasn't necessarily within the letter of the law, but if nobody was saying anything, we didn't know, you know, like we're not gonna go research the law, you know, and parents don't know, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, um, that's an interesting point you bring up. Yeah, you guys are our colleagues. I've actually had a great experience with the the attorneys that represent the districts and then the, also the attorneys that represent the parents. We work pretty closely with them. So you are right. They do have, there's some pretty good attorneys on both sides of the story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like I always say, I, for most, for the most part, I would say most of the attorneys I work with that or the school system, we have a decent relationship, you know, because it's, we respect each other. Like it, that's the whole point of the law. That's the whole point of things is like, there's a difference of interpretation. Mm -hmm. You know, I really like to believe that all of our hearts are in the right place of what we think is best for the child. It's just, we don't always agree on what that should be. And right. so, you know, um, not that like nobody wins in litigation. I always say that, you know, mm -hmm. nobody really wins in litigation because no matter what, you're taking so much out of everything. Um, but unfortunately, the child's the one that loses the most, even when you win, at literally, you know, in litigation. But, you know, like when talking with other attorneys, it's like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, OK, you think it should be this and we think it should be that. And like, here's a law and we'll put it in front of a judge and see which way we go. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and a lot of times it's not even we don't even have to go to litigation because we'll come to a happy medium, you know, and just find that happy place. Um, I know for me, a lot of times what I've seen is that parents just don't feel heard. True. Totally yeah, ignored. I 100 percent agree with you with that, because looking at it from this lens, you know, having them feel heard and having them understand the process speaks volumes. Uh, and that's what all of our practitioners in the company have been made aware of. Um, and it, it goes a long ways, you know, just to be transparent and have that feeling of comfort and and all of that. 100 percent. Right. Yeah. And, th and that's the thing. And it's also like and I say, you know, knowledge is power. We all say that. And it's just what I say, you know, people are like, well, what do you suggest for like any new parents or somebody that just got a diagnosis? It's like, what do you suggest? I'm like, go educate yourself, find parent mm -hmm. groups with similar diagnosis, you know, with kids with similar diagnosis mm -hmm. or just disabilities and, you know, um, in general, follow people on Instagram, YouTube, all of that, and just educate yourself because, True. Yep. You know, like it, it's it, the teachers don't know the laws. The people in the school system don't know the laws. You know, parents don't know the the teacher language, the psychologist language. Like there's so many different areas, like you were saying, like with, with the sports medicine, how it helps you so much as a psychologist. An average psychologist doesn't know all of that other, you know, the OT, the PT and all of the other stuff. Yeah. Which just changes and everything. So that advice is good. And also connecting with the community. So big proponent for that is, you know, you're not in this alone, right? right. There's, there's those self-help groups. There's the community um, connecting people with Lindenwood Bell or Orton Gillingham or any of that. I find a lot of joy in that actually is really, really bringing the community together. Yeah. That's, I, I do a lot on that is that, you know, who's in, you know, your village, who's in your community and let's mm -hmm. build it together because mm -hmm. it's um, you know, you learn the most from parent groups yeah. You know, I'm in so many parent groups in Facebook and it just, it's funny because like, you know, being a parent of children with neurodiversity and being an education attorney, it's like that mm -hmm. finding that like, yes, I'm here as a parent, you know, like I'm not here as an education attorney, but I can't take that part of me out. So <laughs> yeah. sometimes it'll be like, so my experience has been, but I've had clients and if you want to check out a YouTube video, you know. But it's always that fine line because I don't want to, I don't want people to feel that I'm in the group to to promote my business because that's mm -hmm. not the reason. I'm in the group because I have neurodiverse children, and yeah. I learn just as much, you know, from parent other parents as they learn from me. And it's just, it's that natural environment, right? Um, Gaining but more. But I'm also, yeah, I'm also free with. I'm always 
happy to invite, you know, give advice or just, you know, recommendations, obviously not legal advice. You can't do that in the, you know, but like in the sense of like, Hey, if you want to know about PWNs, check out this video, or if you want to yeah. learn more about this, you know, go follow this person or, you know, that type of stuff. And I think that is nice about having the, I, I appreciate this podcast because it connects the community, right? So this would have never happened a long time ago where we'd have California talk, you know, West Coast, East Coast discussing things. So in my mind, when I'm going to connect community and I need questions answered, I'll probably send them to you if it's an East Coast question, right? Because because right. the state laws are so different. So that's really nice that this can happen and you do this. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, in today's world, it's not like it used to be very like, you know, we didn't interact as much. But nowadays, like. You know, there's so many people that are six months here, six months there, three months, you know, whatever, that there is a lot of um, integrating like different, you know, different coasts and different, you know, mm -hmm. everybody knows, everybody has family on the East Coast and the West Coast, you know, now. So um, learning about it, because originally people are like, well, why are you having people from California on your show? You're in Maryland. I'm like, because they have information as well. Yeah. And they have, you know, and in a lot of people like i'm assuming you just so you just practice in california well you for say, now yeah but we right, have uh, coming soon offices in phoenix and las vegas and and about six or seven other states wow, so, so yeah there's a need for our community our school psychology community to do more private practice um and clinical psychologists have their place in their grade but um they don't know ed code right. so while we can have a clinical psych do a report, it has to be meaningful and has to integrate in the IEP and has to integrate into the law. Right. So I, I just saw that need as well. It's like, okay, Nevada and Arizona and Texas, we all we need more of the school psychs to do this stuff. And I was yeah. actually a big proponent of there's some good psychologists in Maryland, actually. So when I, when I talk to the people in California, I'm like, hey, we need to open this up to make sure that if a parent needs a, a good evaluation in dyslexia, let's say, and they want to choose a, a psychologist in Maryland, they should be able to do that, right? Right. Um, so I'm 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 having advocate advocacy uh, towards that to kind of open it up to to the community. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great because that's I mean, and and that's the thing. It's it's. I know there's a lot of people that do international and state, and and as we say, it's different, but it's possible and you know the thing is is that like there's some states that just, they don't have anybody period mm -hmm. you know and so Alaska. it's yeah yeah they, very sure. few yeah so they were at the conference this year and the directors were there from the different districts so uh, uh that's also something on my my radar to kind of make sure that we can help support them you know my my home state right so. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I know like in Utah, there's like nobody out there to help mm -hmm. and, you know, and they're needed just as much. And it's, you know, people are like, oh, well, it's a smaller school district. They don't have the money and this and that. And I'm like, but they're getting federal funds mm -hmm. and not having the money is not an excuse. Correct. Like they're legally required to do certain things and provide certain things. I mean, they don't have to go overboard crazy, you know, develop a program just specific for one child, but they have to have options available mm -hmm. to support. And they can't just say, well, we don't have the money. We don't have to do that because that yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. Um. So like what, so I know you're saying like in the community, so what's like, what else is going on? Like, um, so you're branching out. That is so exciting to hear like a year in and like you're growing right. so big. That's so exciting. Yes. Um, yeah. So how, like, how is that, how does that work? So if people are like, oh, wait, I might need a private evaluation and like the, like, I love the idea that you do all of it. Cause that's an issue we have here often is like, okay, so the OT has to do this, the physical therapist mm -hmm. and then the psychologist, which they all talk a little bit, but it's not as full mm -hmm. comprehensive report with everything in like, how does that work? in your organization yeah so growing is a wonderful thing uh so it's it's it works very well <clears throat> so depending on the need of the child uh and what type what the previous ieps and the documents have said in the past we're kind of looking at that and analyzing what is needed and sometimes we work closely with lawyers to see you know what's going on what do we what do we need to help support this kiddo right or what, how, how is, how has the district failed to provide FAPE, which is the free, you know, the free appropriate yeah. public education. 
Um, so we compile a team together. So it's a school psychologist, a speech path, an OT, an adaptive physical education specialist all together. And then they do their own independent reports, but they're, they are together. So it, it, it is kind of like, this is report one of four. Um, and, and so then they collaborate as a team to kind of decide what would be in the best interest of the student. Wow. And then do they, I'm assuming you guys testify if needed as expert witnesses. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Every one of us. Yeah. So if needed, we can go on the stand if, if it goes, if it goes that far, sometimes, you know, just mediation, but if it does go to due process and you have to testify. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Cause I don't think, I mean, I, we have lots of great of everything, but I don't know. Of, I'm trying to think of, I don't like, I don't know of any that do all of it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's us. such a great, yeah. yeah, no, it's just like, there's a need. So hopefully you'll spread nationwide. <laughs> yeah. And that's the plan, right? Yeah. Um, that, that is the plan. So Arizona and, and Nevada will be next for that to help support. Yeah. That is yes. awesome. Yeah, I love that. So then those are the, so you're in the areas and I know we'll, we'll probably put it in the show notes. We'll go into a little bit more specifics of the areas that you're in and people to contact you. Yeah. Um, so like what, like, I don't know. Um, what could you suggest? I'm just trying to think of like to parents, like most of our listeners are parents and caregivers mm -hmm. or children. Like what, is, are there any pointers you could give to them of like what to look for when, you know, when a school psychologist does the evaluation and they're, they just don't feel it's right or things like that to, to get the school to approve the IEE? Um, so great question. So I guess it would depend on where they are in the process, right? Some parents are, have said, you know, I've requested an evaluation. The school just keeps saying, no, we're just going to put in research based interventions, but they don't you know, they try, yeah. but they don't really track it and there's no data to support it. So I'm always educating parents on, you know, their rights. You know, you have 15 days to respond with an assessment plan for your approval and signature. And then in California, you have 60 days to test. Um, so I would advise parents uh, to make the relationships with the school. Make that relationship with your principal and your school psychologist, because those are the two people that run the school for the most part, right? assistant principals yeah. and all of them it's, it's, if it's a large school. Um, but make those relationships and and try to have an open dialogue about what you're seeing. Um, and if it, it doesn't quite, um, you know, mom, moms have mom gut, right? You get yeah. that oh, mommy yeah. gut. So oh, yeah. if you're going through the assessment and you get mommy gut, you got to trust it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one, make that relationship with the school staff. Uh, to make them feel somewhat comfortable, right? Say, hey, I got right. these concerns from my kiddo. But at the same time, if you're getting that mom gut, that's when you kind of need to call us to make sure and double check. And we're, we're, we're the ones that give that outside double assessment to make sure. Right. Yeah. And, th and that's what I say all the time. Like, but I say parent gut because, you know, <laughs> even the dads and everybody, yeah, yeah, like right. they all, <laughs> and even, you know, like foster parents and even, you know, like mm -hmm. caregivers, like all kinds of, all caregivers, like we just have that instinct like mm -hmm. yes mom gut is different than everybody else's but like they, we all have it like just something's not right here and yes. you can tell automatically and you feel it and trust it um right. you know it's hard because you know as especially newer parents that you know like they don't know they have they have no, no idea what they're comparing it to like is it normal for my kid to talk like this or not you don't know but if something is nagging at you like mm -hmm. trust it and and reach out talk to somebody yeah um yeah, like one of the things I offer is I offer what's called a strategy session. So it's not like a normal consultation. It's when the clients get to speak with me for an hour about what's going on and what the issues are, and we can come up with a plan of action. So it's like, you don't have to know what you want or what you think you need. It's like something's nagging at you and something's not right. And something the school said doesn't seem right. Call and book a strategy session and we can talk through and sometimes it's like, you know what, just go back to the school and say X, Y, Z, and that should solve your issue if it doesn't call us back. But mm -hmm. that like, sometimes that's just all it is, is like you needing to learn the terminology that you need to use for the school. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great advice for the parents as well. Kind of knowing yeah. what to say for sure. Right. Exactly. Learn what to say. And that's going back to the knowledge and, and of course, always put it in writing, you know? Mm -hmm. I always, yeah. I, I, I do say that as well. I say follow up with an email um, yep. and document it. Yep, exactly. Because then yeah. it's, you know, like, per our conversation yesterday, it's my understanding that yeah. XYZ and list it all out and respond. Because then if nothing else, you have that. Well, they, they didn't respond to say it was wrong. 
Correct. Yeah. You know, that's so it's right. Yeah. Which is it's it's sad that you have to think like prepare for litigation and everything you do. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's you know, it's kind of it, it's kind of what you have to do because, yeah. you know, like it just you have to be able to follow what's going on and see what's going on and have it in writing because it, you, you might not even need to ever get to litigation, but like a central office person, like that's what I say often is bringing an attorney to meetings, at least around here, bring central office in and central office will look at stuff and be like, no, 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 no school. You're not doing that right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Similar here too. They have program specialists and different types of um, uh, yeah. jobs that they, they come in and sit in the meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that to align yourself with the principal because it's so true. Mm -hmm. I say all the time that the principal, it, the principal makes or breaks the school, mm -hmm. and uh, and especially the special ed department. Yeah. And how yeah. the principal sees special ed, like you can just tell automatically. Like I know immediately when I walk into a school, like this is going to be a battle because I can tell the way the principal is acting. You know, yeah. I've had I've had principals that like literally, you can see the fear in the teachers face when they go to open their mouth, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and it's like, clearly that's what it is. Um, and it's frustrating because like those principles, like you're not helping anybody like that, you know, get off your power horse, you know, okay. like, it's just, that's not what it's about. Like focus on the child. And hopefully we can help kind of ease the nerves, you know, and that mm -hmm. is at least part of my, my goal for the company is to, if you guys do see that, and there is that unequal amount of power to use your negotiation strategies. Right. A lot of our psychologists in California have taken a class called facilitated IEP training, which uh, Joyce oh, and cool. yeah, Little, yeah. they're in Tennessee, actually. So Joyce and Doug Little own the company and they train all of these departments. So it's kind of like conflict resolution strategies. But you are 100 percent right. If the if the principal's wonderful, it trickles down to the rest of the school. Yeah. Um, and, and the parents can feel that. So making that relationship with the parent and the psychologists are great because things happen at the district level, right? Yeah. That's where the paperwork yeah. happens. You can still have a relationship with your the teacher that's teaching your child, right? Right. And yeah. it can be respectful, yeah. Right. And that's why I say all the time. It's like disagreeing isn't necessarily adversarial. You know, and that's like, I don't, I've heard, you know, other attorneys or advocates that come in and they're like, you need to do this and you need to do that. And you need to do this. And I'm like, that's not getting anywhere because mm -hmm. then as soon as you go in that adversarial, like the other side pulls up their defenses, you know, in that sense. And so it's kind of go in with like, we're talking about this child. I have one client, love them to death. She always brings a big picture, an eight by 10 picture of her child and puts it on the on the table well, at all the that. IEP meetings. I love that. You know, that should because, be mandatory. <laughs> right? Like, it, yeah. and it was funny because like the last meeting we went to, somebody's like, oh, is 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 that him? And we're like, okay, first of all, you shouldn't be saying that in a meeting about this child. But like, uh -huh. yes, that's my child, yeah. you know. Right. Um, but like, it's, you know, remembering, like, we're not talking about this name, you know, we're talking about this child right here. Like, this, yeah. and it's a cute, fun picture. It's not like a little, you know, like, it's just, um, but I like, I keep saying that I need to remind, I'll tell all my clients to start doing that, you know, cause it, yeah, I, you should, because it brings that human element in. Exactly. Exactly. We're Words. talking about a kid here. We're not talking about, you know, it's not who's right, who's wrong. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, oh, well, you know, they say we can't do this or we can do that. It's, you know, this is what this child needs, period. That's what it's here for. Mm -hmm. That's what the law it's individual for this child. Yeah. Um, Yep. Yeah. And then coming to small agreements, because you're right, if you're coming in with guns blazing or vice versa, or the principles that way, the negotiation will, help, will will be hard to be reached. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's why a lot of times with some principles, I'm like, I'll tell you right now, you're not going do not try to go to an IEP meeting without an attorney. You need central office there. Um, yeah, I work with, had, for some wonderful yeah. principles and then I work for some principles that are not so wonderful. Right. Um, but I will wager to guess that the schools that have the great principals have less uh, concerns with yeah. special ed. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you can see the difference when a principal changes. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, once like this, it's a fabulous school. And then all of a sudden, like, I have five clients from that school. Yeah. And it's like, it oh, a new principal took over. <laughs> like that explains yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, which is sad and it's hard. But it's, you know, a lot of it's also 
you know, how you were trained and how you were brought up to think about special ed. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, there's still a large group of educators that think they should be in the back rooms, you know, seen, not heard back in the trailers, you know, mm -hmm. the way it was way back when, um, instead of like, no, they should be up and integrated. Like, um, right. And, and I, that was the benefit about seeing four different districts is some of them had a lot of involvement with principals and some didn't, some principals yeah. were writing prior written notices and some weren't right. Right. Um, so yeah. it just depended on the structure of the district on how they formulated the org, the org chart, right. On yeah. who was doing what. So, uh, that's interesting too, but I agree with you. If if the principals aren't quite fully vested with special ed, then it might not right. go as well. Yeah, and if they don't know what's supposed to be getting being getting done, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing. Is like you know, you have a special ed coordinator that doesn't exactly know what they're doing and doesn't know the laws. They're not doing things right, and if the principal has no idea either, so there's no oversight there. So you don't even know that your special ed department. Right, and, um, and then the psychologist needs to know their stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, and if they don't, then well, we need more education. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. That's where it comes in. Uh -huh. um, there's another education attorney. And we were talking about it. It was, it was a long time ago, a couple of years ago. We were like, yeah, we should do a class on like how to not get sued by the parents. Uh -huh. You know, like, <laughs> okay, good one. just simple basics, like what to not say. Like, you yeah. cannot say, oh, well, we don't have the money for that. Like, that's not legal. Like, yeah. 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 Um, and surprisingly, I have there has been schools that have said that even when I'm in the meeting, you know, have said certain things. And I've had like attorneys go and say, um, yeah, Ms. Schefter, can you and your client give us a minute? <laughs> you know, like, and they, you know, have true. Gone yeah. And, set them and I, I, I think it, you know, this is my philosophy. I think it might be beneficial for the teachers when they're going through school to have more training in special ed. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause they don't know. And they're just coming from the heart because they're teachers and sometimes they misspeak, but you know, yeah. when it's, when it gets to that level, there's things that you can and can't say, right? Yeah. Uh, I remember when I, so I did my undergrad in early childhood. And when I went back um, after teaching a couple of years to get my master's in special ed, I remember like sitting in the classes and I'm like, why do they not teach this in gen ed? Like, this is just good teaching, you know? And I just wonder like if more gen ed teachers had this special ed training, like, I don't want to say that the IEPs wouldn't be needed as much, but they wouldn't be needed as much because kind of if you integrate this stuff in your regular best mm -hmm. teaching practices, then it, you don't need an IEP to say to clarify directions or to use a picture schedule or stuff because you just have that naturally in your classroom. Yeah. Yep. And it's not like it's not like, oh, you can't use that for gen ed. It's only a special ed thing like it's it's for kids, period. Yeah, it comes down to the foundation. So, right. We will do our best to advocate here in our state for that, however that looks. Exactly. Um, yeah, but and I do, with behavior too, like, you know, kiddos having behavior, sometimes teachers aren't versed on it. Right, or where it's coming from. Because I have, I you know, I've said it over and over again, like there's two reasons that you have kids with mis that misbehave in class. It's one, they're so far behind, they have no clue what's going on, and they don't want anybody else to realize that. Mm -hmm. Or two, they're so far ahead, they're bored out of their minds mm -hmm. and like need to find something to entertain themselves with. Correct. Like, that's when you have the behavior issues. And so you can do an FBA and, and all of that, you know, the functional behavior assessment, all this other stuff. But if you're not getting to the root of the problem, you're not, mm -hmm. you know, you're never going to change the behavior because it's not a behavior issue. It's, you know, what's what's the real underlying issue that's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So um, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yes. I love having you on the show. So if people want to get in touch with you, I know we're going to have it in the show notes. Like what's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah. So the best way to reach out would be to call one of our offices um, for the phone number in Orange County, or you can email admin at cdacompany.com. And, uh, and our website is uh, cdacompany.com. And then you can kind of go and check those those phone numbers out there. So. Awesome. And I know that yeah. we will have this on the show now. So thank you so yeah. much for being on the thank show. You. Thank you for inviting me. I, I absolutely love watching this show and you guys have done a wonderful job. So I really thank appreciate you. being on it. You've been listening to Stress-Free IEP with your host, Francis Schefter. Remember, you do not need to do it all alone. 
You can reach Francis through SchefterLaw.com, where prior episodes are also posted. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and sharing the show with others through YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more.